Thanks, Greg. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome today, and thank you for joining this learning series webinar, The Opiate Epidemic and the Impacts on Families. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by the Partnership for Drug for New Jersey and is being held in collaboration with NJ Cares and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General. And I thank them for their partnership, support, and collaboration on today's learning activity and throughout the year uh, on this learning series. We're so pleased to have all of you with us today and also our featured expert speakers who are going to share with us some, some strategies, some information, some strategies, and some successes. Um, we have Dr. Suzanne Boris, Assistant Division Director for Planning, Research, Evaluation, and Prevention at the New Jersey Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. We have Susan Long, who is the Director of Hope One of Atlantic County. Uh, Donna Stefano, the founder of Parents in Connection for Kids. And we have Pam Capassi, the CEO of Hope Sheds Light. And I thank you all for being with us today, our speakers. Um, and without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to you, Suzanne. Okay, thank you. Next slide, you could go. Um, and then we, we'll skip this. I, this isn't quite the updated um, uh, presentation, but all right. I'm going to talk to you today about some of the programs that we at the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services have for families. And um, this is just a list of the seven I'll be talking about today. So we can move on and I'll, I'll mention each one of these to you. Okay, Strengthening Families is a prevention program that we do. It's an evidence-based uh, family skills training program for high-risk and general population families that's recognized both nationally and internationally. And what happens is parents and youth attend weekly Strengthening Families skills classes together, learning parenting skills and youth life and refusal skills. Uh, there's a separate class training for parents and youth in the first hour, followed by a joint family practice session um, at the second hour. And using documented evaluation tools, uh, the Strengthening Families has proven to be effective in reducing multiple risk factors for later alcohol and drug abuse, mental health problems, and delinquency. It's effective because it was specially crafted to increase protective factors and reduce risk factors that lead to both substance abuse and youth depression. Currently, we have 11 agencies of our prevention agencies providing the Strengthening Families uh, curriculum in New Jersey. And in 2020, we serve 633 families. Okay, next. All right, a really great program, relatively new that we have developed is our Family Support Centers. And the regional family support centers are a free resource and support to family members who have a loved one with substance use disorder. As I said, there's three of them and they provide individualized and group peer-to-peer -peer family support services to families in each region. The centers offer direct family support, education, resources and advocacy in a confidential and safe and non-stigmatizing environment. Each regional center is staffed with a family support coordinator that has lived experiences who are also specially trained in something called the Community Reinforcement and Family Training Craft Model, which teaches family self-protection along with non-confrontational skills to help empower their loved one to seek treatment as well as helping each family member to develop and work on their own individualized wellness recovery plan. Okay, family support coordinators are available via phone, text, email, and Zoom for one-to-one -one sessions and weekly virtual support groups. The overall goal of the uh, family support center coordinator is to provide compassionate support to empower family members to have a better quality of life, improve their psychological health, reduce levels of stress, help them feel less isolated, and gain skills needed to cope with their loved one's use. And families who receive family support services also will receive a naloxone training and kits to assist their loved ones that are at risk of opioid overdose. Okay, next. Okay. 
Okay, another resource is uh, the New Jersey Connect for Recovery, which is a free confidential call line focused on helping family members and friends coping with a loved one's substance use disorder. Calls are answered live by counselors and trained uh, family peer support specialists weekdays from eight to 10, also sometime on Saturdays and Sundays and also on holidays, uh, messages left or returned the next business day. It's a service of the Mental Health Association in New Jersey, and it provides a safe, non-judgmental place for individual and family members to get counseling and assistance uh, from professional staff members on substance use issues. It provides um, uh, emotional support, education, um, and ongoing family and peer guidance and access to treatment options through our REACH NJ. And it also offers craft training and evidence-based intervention to help families uh, that I mentioned earlier with our family support centers. Okay, next. And just very briefly, I just wanted to reemphasize the uh, craft model. Um, as I said, our family support centers offer this for you. Um, it's an intervention, a scientifically based intervention designed to help concern significant others engage their treatment refusing um, individuals uh, who use substances into treatment. And this new intervention was developed with the belief that uh, concerned us, um, significant others play a powerful role in helping to engage the substance user who's in denial to submit to treatment. And it is often the individual um, who is using substances that reports family pressure or influence is the reason treatment is sought. Um, the CSOs who attend the craft program also benefit by becoming more independent and reducing their depression, anxiety, and anger symptoms, even if their loved ones do not enter treatment. It uses an overall positive approach and steers clear of any confrontation. It's a culturally sensitive program. Next. Um, just a few other points. It's some of the components of CRAFT or how to stay safe, outlining the context in which substance abusing behavior occurs, teaching CSOs how to use positive reinforcers. Um, it teaches the CSO how to use this information in a motivational way to increase the chance that the individual using substances will enter treatment. And the research has shown that almost seven out of 10 people who use this program get the individual using substances to attend treatment. Okay, next. Okay, another program we have is our opioid overdose recovery program. And it's designed to respond to individuals reversed from opioid overdoses and treated at hospital emergency departments as a result of reversal. Our ORP program uses recovery specialists and patient navigators to engage individuals reversed from an overdose and transported to the um, emergency department to provide non-clinical assistance, recovery support, and appropriate referrals for assessment and substance use disorder treatment. The ORP will meet with family members who may be present, which very often they are. So this is a good resource um, to, to help you know, if your loved one has suffered an overdose. Uh, providers deliver or assertively link individuals to appropriate and culturally sensitive services and provide support and resources throughout the process. And the specialists and navigators maintain follow-up for at least eight weeks. And at a minimum, recovery specialists are accessible and on call from Thursday evenings through Monday mornings. But many of our programs, if not, I think at this point, all of them do have 24-7 um, availability. All right, next. Another specialized program is our Maternal Wraparound Services Program, known as MRAP. It's a statewide initiative that provides intensive case management and recovery support services for pregnant women with substance use disorder during pregnancy and up to one year after the birth event. Uh, the intensive case management focuses on developing a single coordinated care plan for pregnant and postpartum women, their infants, and families. Um, intensive case managers work as liaisons to all relevant entities involved with each woman, and the recovery specialists provide non-clinical assistance and recovery supports while maintaining follow-up with the women and their infants. Next. 
So the overall goal of our MRAP program is to alleviate barriers to services through comprehensive care coordination that's implemented within the five major timeframes when the intervention in the life of the substance exposed infants can reduce potential harm of prenatal substance exposure. So that, that includes pre-pregnancy, prenatal birth, neonatal, early childhood. And our program's intended to promote maternal health, improve birth outcomes, and reduce the risks and adverse consequences of prenatal substance exposure. Next. Um, another program we have is our Integrated Opioid Treatment and Substance Exposed Infants Program that we call IOT-SEI. And this provides a, an array of services for opioid-dependent pregnant women, their infants, and family, ranging from substance use disorder treatment, prenatal and postpartum medical obstetric services, care coordination, sober living arrangements, wraparound services such as intensive case management and recovery support. And the overall goal is to improve outcomes for pregnant women with opioid use disorder, their infants and families. And this initiative promotes maternal health, improves birth outcomes and reduces the risk and adverse consequences of prenatal substance exposure. Next. And finally, we have um, our Pregnant and Parenting Women uh, programs known as PPW. So we get the, uh, a substance abuse block grant, um, as ABG, and from the federal government, and it requires all states to set aside 5% of its allocation for pregnant and parenting women. Uh, so we appropriate our funding to support a statewide network of licensed substance use disorder treatment providers in all modalities for pregnant and parenting women and women with dependent children under child welfare supervision. And the levels of care that we include involve um, outpatient methadone, outpatient, long-term residential, short-term residential, and halfway house. Okay, next. Move to the next slide. Okay, this, I'm not gonna go through all this, um, it's in the presentation, but these are just some examples of the services uh, that are provided uh, through our pregnant and parenting women um, programs. Basically, they, it utilizes a family-centered approach, offers individual counseling sessions or family counseling sessions. Um, we use an evidence-based parenting skills curriculum and choices curriculum. Um, uh, child care is provided if needed. Um, we offer the uh, choices uh, curriculum and strengthening families program is also offered that I had mentioned earlier. So this slide just will show you the list of um, potential uh, links to some resource information. The first one is uh, for ReachNJ, which if you're seeking substance use disorder treatment, you know, they can direct you and refer you. Uh, the next one is a link that will take you to county flyers we have uh, that describe the different types of recovery and um, supportive services we have. It doesn't list all of them, but it gives you a nice flavor of some, some of the uh, county-based programs we have. Uh, the next is our basic treatment directory. And of course, the last one is the SAMHSA treatment locator, um, if you're you know, interested in trying to find treatment. But just wanted to emphasize that you know, our services for families span the whole continuum of care. So what I tried to highlight for you today was uh, things we do in prevention, what we do in treatment, and what we do in recovery support. Okay, that's it. And then the last slide is my contact information. If you have further questions, thank you for allowing me to tell you about our programs. Thanks so much, Suzanne. All that information um, was really um, significant, and it's great to know these services are available uh, from DMHAS, and um, appreciate you sharing them. Um, we'll um, hold the questions till the end, and then we'll come back to ask all of our panelists, uh, the questions that you are submitting in the chat. Um, but now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Susan Long. Uh, Susan is the director of Hope One of Atlantic County. Susan, thanks so much for uh, being with us today. Hi, everyone. I'm really grateful to be here today. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Susan Long. I'm a licensed social worker in New Jersey. And today I'm going to talk about how social workers can help families impacted by substance use disorders. Next. 
So I think it's really important to start with talking about how addiction is a disease. The American Society of Addiction Medicine defines addiction as a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that often become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Next slide. So see, some, here are some statistics. Um, they are quite eye-opening. Um, approximately 40 million Americans experience issues with substance use disorders. Substance use affects more Americans than heart conditions, diabetes, or cancer. 80 million Americans engage in risky use of substances with the potential for substance use disorders. This threatens both safety and public health but does not meet clinical criteria for a diagnosis. Addiction is a developmental disease. Over 90% of individuals who experience issues with substances begin smoking, drinking, or using substances before the age of 18. Um, research, research shows that the earlier the, the substance use starts, the greater the risk of addiction. 75% of all high school students have used substances with addiction potential. This includes cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, or cocaine. One in every five of those students develops a problem with substances. And sad, sadly, almost 100,000 overdose deaths were reported in a 12-month period from September of 2020 to September 2021. Next slide. So it's also really important to recognize that addiction is a family disease. It, um, everyone in the family is, is affected one way or another. Addiction can affect the entire family unit, not just the individuals engaging in using substances. So often family members can feel um, confused, disconnected, angry, they blame themselves, they worry, and this often causes um, huge rips in family dynamics. Everyone is literally impacted. The family is a system and systems are always looking for homeostasis. So if one part of the system is out of whack, everything else can, can really be out of whack. And in order to heal, it's really important that everyone looks for their own help, whatever that looks like. And we'll talk about some resources for help um, at the end. Um, addiction often has significant negative impact on the family. It disrupts things like attachment styles, family roles, rituals, routines, social lives, finances, and communication. Families in which there is a parental substance use disorder are often characterized by an environment of secrecy, loss, conflict, violence, or abuse, emotional chaos, role reversal, and fear. 46% um, 40, of children, I thought this was really um, a staggering statistic, 46% um, of children live in a household where an adult is smoking, drinking excessively, misusing prescription drugs or using illegal drugs. So one of the first steps in helping families, it's really important to provide education on the disease of addiction. By educating the family, they're able to um, set healthy boundaries. Boundaries are super important. Um, and then they can gain a better understanding of behavior patterns due to the use of the substances. Next slide. So I came across this, uh, this pretty cool chart. It, it, shows ways in which the substance use disorders can affect the entire family unit at all stages of life. So it shows like it shows what a typical life stage looks like and then the, the negative impact that addiction has on the developmental task and stages. So for example, it has the child rear, the child rearing families, they strive to create loving homes for infants and parents and establish secure attachment with their children. And then when substance use comes into the household, it can disrupt home life in the home um, or disrupt home life. And then the home is not physically or emotionally safe due to impairment and labile mood and insecure attachment with infants can develop. Next slide. And then some other stages are it has the families with teenagers, they work to balance freedom with responsibility, establish healthy peer relationships and develop educational and career goals. 
So when there's a substance use disorder in the home, teen, teens often model, their if their parent has a substance use disorder, they can model that. Children may have difficulty forming healthy peer relationships due to impaired early attachment. Other areas of conflict that may develop include school problems, legal problems, family conflict, anxiety, depression, or oppositional disorders. And another one is the family the, or the middle-aged parents work towards rebuilding marriage and maintain ties with younger generations. And then if they have um, addiction or substance use in the house, it can cause marital conflict, disconnect with adult children, and they may not want them to be around their younger children. That's just some of them. Next slide. So this attached photo um, was adopted from SAMHSA. SAMHSA is a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So some things they encourage you to do if you find out a loved one is dealing with mental health issues and or a substance use disorder. So it's really important that we remember that mental health um, disorders and substance, substance use disorders are treatable. People can, and they often do recover. Family support can make a difference in that. It's important to talk to your loved one, express your concern, tell them you're there to help, create a judge-free and loving environment to foster conversation and openness. Be open and, um, if there is a history of um, family, uh, or history in your family of mental illness or substance use disorders, it's important to talk about that. Um, it may feel your, your loved one feel, or it may help your loved one feel less alone show compassion, be patient as you help your loved one locate resources and treatment services. Be sure to care for yourself too. This is really, really, really important. Being a caregiver can be highly stressful and emotionally draining. It's very important to take care of yourself. Seek support. If you or a loved one needs help, reach out and ask for help. If it's not for them, reach out for yourself. Um, I cannot stress the, the, enough the importance of self-care for the entire family. Oftentimes, I, as a social worker, I have um, I help family members as well try to help the the family member struggling with addiction, and and at the same time they're they're decompensating from the stress and um, how they're affected by the addiction in their household. So it's really important that everybody gets help. Um, so yeah, so the focus is often surrounding on how to help the loved one struggling with substance use disorder and mental health issues. But if there needs to be more focus on how it's affecting their lives, your their loved ones' lives, and the importance of them utilizing support systems such as family support groups or clinical services. Oftentimes, the fam uh, the family member struggling with addiction might not be ready for help, so it's important that um, if they're not ready, that you get help for yourself. Next slide. So I love resources, and there's so many out there. Um, these are some resources for individuals struggling with a substance use disorder. Uh, if you are in a psychiatric crisis or medical emergency, it's really very important that you call 911 before you call the other resources. So I work for Hope One of Atlantic County. Hope One was created by the, the Sheriff of Atlantic County, Eric Scheffler, and we provide mobile outreach services and we connect individuals that are struggling with substance use disorders or mental health issues with direct linkages to treatment. Anybody can call us at that number and um, ask for Hope One, and we will get back to you right away. And we can help um, to find treatment for, for your loved one or treatment for yourself if you need help or you need support. We also have an ID program. If somebody has um, IDs, are often a barrier to getting treatment. So we can make IDs at the Sheriff's Department um, for, for anyone to get them into treatment. Also, the Mental Health of Association of New Jersey, I have one here. I love them. They have tons of um, support groups. They have over 80 support groups online. They have um, various supportive services as well as programs to assist with families that are struggling with a family, uh, family member in crisis. And we have Ascenda. I love them too. <laughs> Healing Hearts and Minds. Um, with Ascenda, we often refer uh, individuals and families to that program. So that's a voluntary service. Um, it's provided at no cost to families who are dealing with the effects of parental substance use. And they provide clinical in-home therapy for the person struggling with the substance use, and they can also be in recovery. 
um, and they work with the family um, individually and as a whole. And that program is available in Atlantic, Cape May County, and Ocean County. Um, we also have NAMI on here. NAMI is really great. They provide a lot of um, resources to families, especially families that are struggling with um, severe mental uh, illness in their family. Next slide. So these are some um, resources for family members. I also really recommend that um, family members consider therapy if they're able to um, access therapy. It's really important that um, they get help from themselves, whether you know things are going well or not so well. It's really effective. Very therapy can be very helpful. And there's some of the 12 step support groups on here, such as Al-Anon, Naranon, Alan Teen. They're often offered in person and online. Next slide. And then I put some flyers here for different family support groups. This one is run by Jeff Flowers. He's actually my old coworker and my friend, and he's a great clinician. So this is one, uh, they have it once a month and it's a free program and it's open to anyone and, and it's on online. Next slide. And then um, Parents to Parent is a great resource for um, individuals struggling with substance use and their families. Um, it was created by four mothers who lost um, family members due to a, the disease of addiction. They offer various support groups, and one of those on here is a grief group. Um, and they have case management, crisis intervention, resource connection, workshops, and much more. And then I have the the um, the flyer for Hope All Day Recovery Center in Mays Landing has this group um, every Monday that's run by a clinician and everybody that I've um, referred to this group absolutely loves it. Next slide. And wrapping up here, uh, this, this is a really, really, really phenomenal program. Um, I just referred that as somebody there yesterday and they're already working on helping the, uh, it's a mom who has a son that's struggling. So this is um, the Center for Family Services has this program called Reconnections and it's a family support program which offers um, really the most incredible family services. They serve, they have, um, they serve Atlantic County, Burlington, Camden, Cape May, Cumberland, Gloucester, Ocean and Salem. They offer peer-to-peer -peer coaching, support services to family, friends, and loved ones of the individual struggling with addiction, and they offer much, much more. Please check them out, they're phenomenal. Next slide. And then here, these are my, um, my citations for your reference. Next slide. And there is my contact info. Please reach out to me if you have any questions, concerns, or if you, you need help for somebody, or if you need help with a referral, getting somebody in the treatment, I would be happy to help. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, appreciate you sharing all of those um, resources with us. I know there was a lot of information uh, that you shared, so I just want to make sure everyone is aware that um, following the presentation, you'll receive an email on how to access the slides as well as a recording of today's presentation. I know there's a lot of conversation in the chat about that, about whether you'll be able to get a copy of all of those resources that both Suzanne and Susan um, shared. So yes, uh, you will. And also um, just wanna make note, there's gonna be some information in the chat about the Today and J calendar. That is a calendar of uh, prevention, treatment and recovery events that are taking place all across the state. So you can uh, review those, uh, that calendar to get updates on um, information that uh, is available and events that and meetings that are available similar to the ones that um, Susan and uh, Suzanne mentioned. Um, now we're going to transition over to um, Pam Capaci. Pam uh, is the CEO of Hope Sheds Light, an organization that um, has been featured on the learning series already uh, in the past and um, is always there to uh, really talk about um, the family and the support that is available. So uh, Pam, thank you so much for being with us and I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Angela, and good morning or afternoon. I'm not sure where we are. Good morning, everyone. And I uh, really appreciate being a part of the panel today. Some of what I'm going to present might 
might duplicate the message that you've heard in, in the with the previous presenters, but um, you can't hear it enough, first of all. And and second of all, I, you know, I will just speak briefly about Hope Sheds Light. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, I'll share our mission. Um, you know, our mission is to raise awareness and educate individuals, families, and the community about the impact of addiction, uh, really by having the courage to share personal experiences and offer strength, wisdom, and hope, and resources that can lead to positive community change and long-term recovery. Hope Sheds Light was founded by three family members um, who lost their sons to drug overdoses. Uh, we're located in Ocean County traditionally and now also expanded into Monmouth County. Um, but we, you know, our origins are in Ocean and our origins are when the opioid epidemic really started to hit New Jersey and Ocean County was oftentimes referred to as the epicenter. Um, and it, it took our families by surprise in Ocean County, just how uh, quickly we started to lose so many of our family members and so many young people. So like other organizations like Parent to Parent and um, several others around the state uh, that sprung up as a sort of reaction to losing loved ones, being overwhelmed by the opioid epidemic and feeling kind of lost in that process, um, our founders and Hope Sheds Light has really dedicated the last eight years um, of our existence in trying to find that peer-to-peer -peer connection to family members, uh, providing like a bridge and a local resource, a bridge to clinical care if that's needed, a bridge to um, accessing addiction services, treatment services, support services, um, and really starting to introduce to families that they too need to recover, that they have to go on their own recovery journey and um, helping them understand what that process might look like. So um, next slide. You know, just briefly, and you've heard this already, and I only have one slide with statistics, but um, I wanted to set the stage properly that, you know, the Federal Reserve's annual report is now indicating that one in five Americans know someone personally who has suffered from an opioid addiction. Um, and at least 25% uh, percent of the population belongs to a family where substance use disorder has impacted like a first degree relative, a mother, a father, a sister. Um, so that's a huge percentage. Um, and that means that we have so many, you know, unintended uh, victims of this chronic disease that, you know, is not just limiting its impact or its devastation to the individual with the diagnosis, but it's taking everyone in its wake with it. Um, the data also suggests that up to 90% of individuals with active addiction live at home um, with a family member or significant other. That means also that our family members are frontline workers. We're oftentimes the first, you know, makeshift social worker, makeshift, uh, you know, EMT deploying Narcan. Like there are so many traumatic experiences and so many different roles a family member is now playing um, because of this uh, disease and because of this epidemic that um, it's really, you can't say it enough. Uh, addiction affects the whole family and the loved ones and family members need to seek out their own support system, their own support services, and maintain their own wellness. Um, next slide. So we're also expanding what that definition of family peer support looks like. So traditionally, like I said, we really were reaching out. We had a help, we have a helpline still. We have um, a helpline that most of the calls that come into our helpline are from a loved one seeking help for their loved one um, and or an individual who's really looking, you know, they'll get that, uh, you know, first stage of acute care uh, at a treatment facility. And then they're, you know, they're looking for housing, they're looking for other supports. Um, but so what, what this shot, a slide is showing that, you know, yes, addiction affects an individual, but oftentimes it's, you know, referred to as for every one, there's four, for every one person, the illness also impacts four other people. And many times, especially within a home where there's young children and you have 
individuals who are in early recovery or in active addiction, the energy or the, the dynamic in the home that's generated that are signs of the illness are shame and secrets and fear. And there's all this stigma and that's driving, you know, the progression of the disease in terms of what the energy looks like inside a, a home where there's active addiction or periods of remission and recurrence. Um, as it relates to young people who are now becoming, you know, very large numbers of the unintended victims of this disease are young people. You know, there are some traditional roles that I believe we all may have heard of, you know, but it's, it's, it's worth mentioning again that our children will develop certain patterns of behavior, so be, certain coping mechanisms to survive um, in that environment. And so, you know, you'll have the hero child or you'll have the mascot or the lost child. And it's important that if you're working with these families that you understand that these are the way our children are managing uh, to survive within a dynamic where shame and fear and isolation and stigma uh, rules, you know, rules their life. So ne next slide. Again, you know, as we develop comprehensive sort of continuum of care for family members, we need to include young people in that. We need to uh, begin to, um, to offer up to our young people an understanding of addiction that's you know, age appropriate, that includes the medical language so they can start to release themselves from some of that shame, uh, that includes the language of recovery so that it introduces hope and allows them to find a pathway to uh, maintain that loving uh, connection to their family members while understanding that they're struggling with a disease. So, you know, for adults, this slide is more relevant for adults who are also struggling with loved ones that are uh, beginning to show signs of addiction. Um, their recognition and pattern really follows this sort of path similar to what we see when you look at grief work, right? So initially a family member, um, you know, if you're a parent of a teenager or a spouse or, you know, somebody who has a, a close connection to an individual whose behavior is changing, you're not quite sure why um, you kind of have that gut feeling, but you don't want to accept it. Um, you start looking for any other reason, especially when you consider what, what we referenced in terms of shame and isolation and fear and stigma, you start to look for pretty much any other um, reason for the change with this kind of, you know, hope that there is a solution that doesn't include long-term care for substance use disorder. Um, you can remain in a sort of a denial state for a long time and really look for uh, other excuses, you might start to grieve the loss of certain dreams um, and goals and accomplishments that you, you were hoping for. They start to get delayed or derailed um, and event, and you have to let go of what you felt the future might be like in order to move towards a, a place of acceptance. So at Hope Sheds Light, when we offer family support meetings, our meetings are facilitated by family members. So we take the time to train our facilitators. They, they, um, some of them, if they're individuals who are also in recovery themselves, will go through the uh, CCAR Recovery Coach Academy. All of them will go through a craft training um, and we work with them and we help them understand how to just do a peer-to-peer -peer support group. We really see our role as helping move a person through this continuum. You know, it's also been looked at as sort of the stages of change. So we really want a family member to come, feel, uh, not feel judged, be amongst individuals who are, who are living or, or who have lived through the same thing that they're experiencing. Uh, we don't push them to stop enabling or move to acceptance. We just greet them where they are, share our personal stories and allow them to find support and move through this journey um, at their pace um, and what works for their family. But what I've seen time and time again for both myself and the, um, as a family member and the individuals that we help, we do move towards this place of acceptance 
uh, beginning to understand and educate ourselves uh, regarding substance use, understand the dynamics of the disorder, uh, understand the various pathways to recovery that begin to accept that um, although what, I, what we initially envisioned might not be what's happening for our family, that there's a lot of hope and possibility for a, a future that is bright and um, full, of, full of possibilities and hope. And the way we do it really move through that acceptance is to, we begin to educate ourselves. Again, we rely on the support of other family members um, and we begin to understand the different uh, types of behaviors, different pathways and, and, and types of um, progression of the disease within our family members and within ourselves. Um, a lot of this journey is counterintuitive for family members, especially if you're a parent because your instincts as a parent are to go in and save and fix and make better. Um, and we really need to learn that our loved ones addiction journey and recovery journey is theirs. And uh, we have to understand what our role can be and how we can walk alongside them and provide support um, without trying to fix, manage and control. Um, next slide. So I did touch on some of the ways that you can start to do that um, when you come to our meetings or other meetings like organizations that are similar to Hope Sheds Light around the state. We often will have a, a professional who partner really well with the system of care that's out there. You know, um, we work with a lot of the programs that uh, Suzanne referenced earlier in, in the presentation. So we'll bring in um, the director of our local STAR uh, program, or we'll bring in a clinician um, and we will start to educate our group. So the first half hour will be a piece of education. And then the next hour really is, you know, that peer-to-peer -peer conversation and support, reacting to what we learned in the session and also just providing support for each other. We bring in the local organizations that provide the Narcan training. So we're equipping our parents and family members with the resources they need. We understand that this journey is, it's a chronic disease. And so it, we have to learn how to be patient. Um, we have to be prepared uh, for periods of relapse or recurrence um, and, and really begin to understand what recovery looks like, how you build recovery capital within your family. Um, these are all concepts that that we bring forth in our family support meetings with, um, again, just in this sort of non-judgmental comfort environment, hoping to ultimately link um, and walk alongside, link our families to other supports and walk alongside them indefinitely, you know, because we're, we're embedded in, in our communities. We're local and embedded in our communities. Um, the real thing that Hope, Hope Sheds Light does, it's in our name, is provide hope. I think our primary goal is to introduce for the first time maybe to families that rather than uh, living in that shame and that fear, we introduce the possibility of change and hope and we, we try to introduce a pathway uh, for families to, to um, follow that, you know, that can you know, adjust the way they view substance use disorder. Um, next slide. So another, a couple of other, you know, strategies that you can use is definitely um, come out of the closet, basically, reach out for help, get outside input, try not to live in that secrecy um, and isolation and shame. Some of our newer programs um, are targeted towards young people who have um, parents who are in recovery. We actually bring families together who are in early recovery, allowing parents to make new social networks, meet new people who are also seeking a drug-free uh, lifestyle and seeking uh, positive recovery and allow them to build those social networks with their peers, but also bringing the kids together. We had pop-up drive-ins and barbecues and young people can celebrate their families, understand and learn about the language of recovery and um, really not be ashamed of who they are. It's been a it's new, you know, peer work with kids is new, but we're having some uh, really wonderful uh, reactions and responses um, and successes for young families in recovery. Uh, we also recommend highly that you do 
reach out to some kind of peer support, whatever your pathway is. If it's not the 12 steps that, you know, there are so many options out there now. Um, there's Dharma recovery, smart recovery, all recovery. Um, and then, you know, really look for some professional help. And I, I lost track of time, so I hope I'm not going over. So um, it's important to learn how to set some boundaries. We, through our discussions in our support group, we really demonstrate how boundaries work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for myself and the members of our group, uh, we see this, you know, boundary not meaning, okay, the extreme boundary of I can't live with you in active addiction, but you can start with, I'm going to take an hour for myself. And, you know, during that hour, I'm not taking a call. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm and just beginning to set personal boundaries for wellness, uh, moving towards this idea of maybe stepping up and saying, you know, no drug use in my home or whatever works for you. Um, but really discovering what it feels like to set a boundary that's designed to provide you a sense of hope and peace. Next slide. Um, and practice self-care boundaries could be part of self-care, absolutely. But, you know, and, and I, we offer up examples of self-care that are, you know, realistic also. So not everybody has the time or money or resources to take a trip, you know, to a tropical island to relax for the, a week. But there are so many ways that you can just get outside and take a walk. You can try to get some extra sleep. Sometimes, although I don't always love housework, when my house is clean, I feel good about myself. So tidying up, start a garden, get a hug from somebody, make a phone call, take a walk. There are so many free ways um, that you can begin to practice self-care that includes then helping you set some boundaries uh, as family members. So uh, I just wanted to emphasize that. And next slide. So this is just our helpline. Um, like I said, we're really working with some community partners in both Ocean and Monmouth County. We have a family subcommittee of service providers and family members now that are looking at what, what do we mean when we say family? Where does that start? And what's the continuum of services that we can begin to build out to uh, create pathways for recovery for family members? Um, we have a slew of resources. We have you know, we do grief and bereavement groups, family groups, youth groups. We offer yoga and, and, and meditation walks. So I, I don't have all the flyers, but there is our helpline number and that's our website. And you can reach me at either one of those, um, uh, you know, either the helpline or the, through the website. And I really welcome calls and partnership um, as we begin to define more uh, further peer family recovery services. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. And thanks for sharing all of these strategies um, that families can embrace to, uh, to find hope and uh, to move forward. So uh, appreciate your presentation today. I know we're running short on time now, but I want to turn the presentation over to Donna DeStefano from Pick Awareness. Donna shares her story as a way of uh, kind of um, showing how you can, you can move forward in a way that, that impacts and makes a greater impact on the community. So Donna, so uh, pleased that you're here with us today and I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Angela. Hi, everyone. Well, today we've certainly covered a lot on family dynamics and a buffet of resources, but like Pam said, you can never hear it enough. So um, in 2009, my daughter, Laura, started to do heroin. She was 18 years old. She ended up you know, moving out. I rarely saw her. It was, it was awful. So after you know, the pain and shock of all of that, I started a nonprofit and I provided treatment resources and referrals because I just, back then especially, you didn't have what you had now, you know? So today, like when I was preparing for this webinar, I pulled out an old folder of things that I saved when she was in active addiction. I found like letters, cards, things that she wrote from various rehabs and letters from when she was in prison, um, frantic notes, you know, of of mine, just trying to find research for treatment centers, 
you know, it, it was just awful. Um, I had no idea how insurance companies worked, attorneys, public defenders, you know, and I certainly didn't have the relationships and colleagues that I do now where I'd know exactly where to go for treatment admissions or who I could turn to for advice. So it really brought me back to that same sick feeling, you know, that feeling of fear and helplessness that, you know, you get when you go through this. Um, next slide. So this is one of the things that I found in the closet. And you can imagine finding a spoon, you know, and at the time I was wondering where all my spoons went. Um, just finding something like this as a parent, it, it's just unbelievable because you're basically, you're still in kind of denial at the time. You know, you think, okay, they might be, you're not sure, things are missing. You know, it was just awful. But I had to learn, like we had to learn as a family how to communicate. And instead of screaming, you know, like, why are you doing this? Just stop, blah, blah, blah. As I researched and really started informing myself, I realized that, you know, without screaming and judgment and name calling, it actually started to work. I mean, think about it. They feel bad enough. You know, they're not trying to stick it to you. They're not trying to do this to you. It's not you. And it's not your fault. It's nothing that you know, it, it could happen to any family, as everyone said all day long. But, you know, you're, you're just not sure what to do. But you can control, you can basically, you can definitely control your actions. You might not be able to control theirs. But if you stay calm and let them know, you know, you understand, you love them, you know, you understand. And just try to think about what they're going through it actually will bring you closer and they'll open up to you, you know? So anyway, that's, that worked for me and it definitely has worked for others. So next slide, please. Um, I'm a huge advocate. I love to advocate for people who can't do it for themselves. And I know one day I was in the car and a mom called and she said, you know, I don't know what to do. My husband won't let my son come home. You know, he doesn't have any money. He's going to be homeless. I don't know what to do. And I started just thinking, like, what, what could be done? And I happened to look in front of me, and I saw a car with, you know, a cause license plate. And that's how I got the idea. to. Sorry, my dog is barking. <laughs> um, that's how I got the idea to do New Jersey support recovery license plates. All right, so it was passed in January of 2019. I had bipartisan support, which was huge. And, you know, besides raising awareness and helping to reduce stigma, those plates were created to help reduce homelessness due to substance use. And the objective is to raise the necessary funds to provide critical post recovery support, such as housing, job training, health, and wellness assistance. So I'm working currently with Motor Vehicle. We really have everything in place, but because of COVID and everything that's happened, you know, we all know what's been going on with Motor Vehicle. Um, it's kind, it's not a standstill. We're just waiting for a couple of things to be signed, but it's, it's almost ready to go into production. And, you know, I'll definitely let everyone know when that's ready. Um, next slide, please. So in the beginning, you know, you're never sure what to do, but I knew for sure that I wasn't gonna sit back and take it. So learning how to help my own family inspired me to help others. Um, and I volunteered my way into a full-time position in the prevention field at Prevention First. Mary Pat Angelini said I was like a fungus that wouldn't go away, so she hired me. And, you know, I learned a lot there, but here's how you can do it too. All right, so you can, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so you can learn the skills needed to heal and rebuild your family's relationships with co confidence and courage. <laughs> Find a new tribe of people who get you, okay? So some of my best friends right now are people that I met along this journey. Um, start speaking publicly. In this photo, I did speak for um, Drug Free New Jersey. And I have, you know, today I'm speaking, I like to share my story so other families know that, you know, you're not alone, you can go through this, you can survive it, 
you know, maybe, you know, you're lucky enough that your child, your family, your loved one can survive it. Um, yeah, I did that by joining committees. I was an alliance coordinator for Rumson and Fairhaven. I was an alliance coordinator for Point Pleasant Beach. Um, you know, I joined all the different alliances around. I, I started going to every meeting at the governor's council on alcoholism and drug abuse. I started networking, talking, showing up. And now I'm vice co-chair on Jakarta. You know, you volunteer all over the place. You network, you give back, you know, give back, talk to people who need it. Um, okay, next slide. So this is a video we did for the partnership, uh, Moms Knows Best. And it was, you know, four moms whose families were impacted by the opioid crisis. And my family was one of them. In this photo, I was one of the lucky ones. The other three lost their child from addiction. And I was one of the lucky ones. And it's not because of anything that I did or they didn't do. I was lucky. I was lucky because they are great moms. They did everything they could. And, you know, I just, I can't stress enough that it's just not your fault that this is happening. Okay, next slide. In this photo, you know, I, I worked a lot with state and local government. It's a great way to make real policy change, okay? So I worked with Governor Christie. I spoke a lot at the different things that he had. And again, I'm on the on Jakarta. Um, that's Doug Collier, who's now retired, but we worked a lot. We did um, responsible prescribing uh, seminars in Hackensack Meridian hospitals you know, just did a lot of different things that it's advocacy. And if you want to learn, if you want to help your family, help other people, these are ways to do it. Okay, next slide. So this photo, I have, uh, it's stamped there, 10-26-2012. It's a picture of me, my daughter, Cheyenne, my daughter, Jamie, and my daughter, Laura. My daughter, Laura, was about four months drug free at that point. And we were at a prevention first gala and it was the first time that the four of us were together. So, you know, every time I say it, it really chokes me up. Okay, next slide. So, okay, no more slides. <laughs> um, you know, I guess the biggest takeaway is that, you know, you don't have to take it laying down, okay? You can do something about it. You know, when I speak to groups and families and needing guidance and answers, I see that look in their eyes and I remember it all too well. You know, the please help me look, um, you know, just tell me what to do. I don't want my son, daughter, sorry about this dog guys, um, you know, to, to die and they cry. They, they beg me to help them. It's just awful. But you know what? When I get that phone call months later that a person is doing well and, you know, they're back with their children or they're speaking about recovery to empower others, you know, it makes it worth it. Or when that email that I get that someone's son has a great job now and he got his license back, I smile. And especially, you know, when that girl calls me and says, hey, Donna, my parents let me come home now. And they even gave me the key to the house. You know, that's why we do what we do. And it, it's just so important. You know, you can't give up and you have to stay informed and you have to learn. And with that, guys, I'm ending and um, God bless. Thanks so much, Donna. Um, thanks for sharing your story. And all the advocacy that you've done, but for being with us today, um, also uh, here in the chat, your dog is getting a lot of support. So uh, <laughs> no worries, no worries uh, about that, but um, really appreciate you sharing that story. I know we're coming to the end of the time and some people have to jump off. There's, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna pause for a second um, and then we'll go to questions. Um, just a few questions for our panelists. But I did want to mention that the evaluation has popped up on your screen. So if you could give us your feedback on today's event, um, we would appreciate it. Uh, so I'll jump over uh, for our first question to you, Susan. Um, can you talk a little bit more about 
uh, Hope One, the services that someone could expect, how to find Hope One and, and what um, benefit it, it, it could bring to the family and the community? Sure. Um, if they're looking to find Hope One, we do do mobile outreach and we have a schedule on the website and also on our Facebook page. Um, it is in some other counties in the state as well. Um, but if anybody has any specific questions, they could call us directly at 609-909-7200. If um, I did see a question that um, if we help people in different counties, and we certainly do, um, or we'll get you connected to the help that you need. So um, it doesn't specifically have to be um, an Atlantic County resident calling us for help. They can reach in, um, call us and reach out and we will get them connected um, to whatever uh, service they need or level of care for treatment. Um, typically with families, we do, you know, we, we talk to family members. Um, I have social workers on the team and um, a certified peer recovery specialists. Um, so we try to provide as much support as possible, but we also often do refer to programs like Reconnections and Ascend it, um, the Ascend it program I talked about and, um, and to family support groups and, and, and other services. We, you know, we do a lot of connections and linkages. I think, did I answer oh, everything? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And we put, um, I know um, NJ Care shared some information on, accessing Hope One. And, and to your point, there are um, Hope One vehicles in many of the counties across the state. So um, if you're looking for that information, I'd recommend you reach out to your sheriff's office or go to the sheriff's website. And not sure if in all the counties, um, but many times I know they're driving around and, and parked in uh, high traffic areas. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, Suzanne, a uh, question for you, Suzanne, can you speak to any services that are available for um, pregnant uh, women who are um, substance using? Oh, sure. We have, um, um, you know, some wonderful programs in, in our state for women. And in fact, I think New Jersey's recognized as quite a leader in this effort. Um, so one of the programs I had mentioned earlier was our uh, MRAP programs, and that's in seven regions of the state. And what we could do eventually is, um, you know, send, uh, um, you know, a document that would have all, all these different programs listed. But, you know, we have, as I said, the MRAP programs that are in seven regions, so the entire state is covered. So the, the programs will address maybe, you know, three, three counties. Um, we have uh, what I had mentioned earlier, the Integrated Opioid Treatment Services and Substance Exposed Infant Programs, the IOT-SCI, and we have um, five, of five of those throughout the state. Um, and, you know, as I said in my presentation, it offers, you know, various wraparound services, same thing as our MRAP program does, which is, you know, sta statewide. And then I had mentioned earlier about our pregnant and parenting women programs that were required to, you know, support through our block grant funding. And, you know, that that's throughout the state and it goes across a continuum of care. You know, we have inpatient programs or residential programs, short-term, long-term halfway house, and also um, outpatient programs, both methadone or, you know, not, not specifically, uh, you know, methadone programs. And, and as, um, yeah, so those are, like I said, well, I can forward to you, Angela, the um, particular programs, and you know maybe then you might want to share that list. We Absolutely. have, yeah, and yeah, we I have in our state sure. too our women's coordinator, who's Christine Scalise, and I believe she might even be on this webinar. Um, so I'll provide you her contact information that can, um, you know, uh, let people know about the various programs for women but we, we do are, are doing quite a bit. And, and in fact, one thing I didn't mention, because this is more you know, about families and, and, and things, but we do also have a special uh, supported housing program for women called WISH. It's the Women's Intensive Supported Housing Program. All right, great. Yeah, any information that, that you send over, we'll be sure to put on um, the, the event website as well as share um, with all of the attendees via email. So uh, thanks for thanks for that, Suzanne. 
yeah, we'll put something together for you so you could share that with the, you know, all the participants. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Pam, this question is for you. Um, how do you uh, refer someone or convince someone that they should reach out to an organization like yours, like Hope Sheds Light, um, and that the family also needs um, support? How, how do you have that conversation with a loved one? So usually the loved one is reaching out to us through our helpline. Um, but I think for an organization like Hope Sheds Light, people come to us mainly through word of mouth. Um, and then, you know, also our on, we have a pretty strong online presence, but in terms of um, suggesting to an individual that they need, are you asking, and I'm sorry if I'm not answering this correctly, how you get a person to initially come to Hope Sheds Light? Um, yes, the question is, you know, how do you get your spouse, um, your sister who has a child who has right. um, an addiction, how do you... Uh, right. Convince them that it's a family uh, disease and, and they got you. you know, I understand the question. So okay. oftentimes we don't try to convince people of, of anything. So we we ask the individual who is, you know, coming to us to, look, you know, start to make some changes for themselves. And oftentimes when that happens, that's there's a ripple effect within the family. But in addition to that, I, I have to admit that when somebody finds their way to our office or our helpline, they're usually in crises and they're usually only focused on how to help their loved one. So <clears throat> what we like to do is, you know, we our family coaches are trained in crafts. So we really do like to start to introduce a language, um, non-confrontational language. They're also trained in uh, the C car. So really beginning to help somebody, their loved one start to recognize that what they're verbalizing and the way they're acting aren't really lining up. So, um, so it's, it's a gradual process, but we actually do shift off of this idea that we can help you convince your loved one to get help. And we move on to this idea of let's start with helping you. Let's help you understand some new language and new skills and get some self-care and see how that might have a ripple effect on your loved one. And that concept is supported through the other, you know, family members that are sitting in that room saying, I remember coming in in crises just like you and, you know, please have faith this process works. I hope that really answers your question. I think it does. Uh, thank you. And Donna, um, can you speak to if someone wants to um, get involved or become an advocate, uh, what are some, what are some, you know, first steps that you would recommend? Um, you know, like I referenced before, there's plenty of local things that they could do. They could join their local alliance, their coalitions, um, reach out to some of the prevention agencies, um, you know, places like Hope Shed Light, even, you know, different meetings, just starting to, starting there, I would say, um, I think that's the most important, or, you know, even like the health department. Uh, like Monmouth County, the addiction office there, they offer a lot of different things. They have a lot of different meetings. Um, that would be something that I, that I did, and it was very helpful. And then from there, you'll get other resources from people there, and you just keep moving on. So definitely start connecting with um, what already exists in your community and grow from there is... I mean, I would, I would start locally. And then also, I mean, obviously the state, like what Suzanne said, you know, earlier, there are so many resources, but if you don't know how to navigate that and you're, you know, you're not sure starting locally can get you there. All right. Thank you. So I know we're, we're running on time, but I did want to go back to our speakers just for one last comment. If there's one um, thought or message you would like to leave with the families who are on with us today. Um, we'll go, we'll start with you, Suzanne. Let me unmute here. Sure. I would just say to families to don't give up. There is hope. And there are lots of resources in the state of New Jersey. You're fortunate to be in this state because we've done, done a lot 
and we design things, you know, to really try to help you. So please take advantage of these programs. And, you know, if you're having trouble navigating, feel free to reach out to me and I can steer you in the right direction or connect you to the right person. But as I would say, always keep up hope because we know addiction is a disease from which an individual can recover. So just keep that thought in mind. All right. Thank you so much, Susanna. Thanks again for being with us today. Um, Susan, uh, any last thought from you? I would just say for the families, just to remember to take care of themselves. It's really, really important. Um, you know, families become really fixated on saving their family member and it's, they can't save their family member. They can provide support and love and encouragement, um, with healthy boundaries and, um, and hopefully they will get the help one day, but um, just to really take care of yourself and self-care is really, really important. And um, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Again, thank you for being with us today. You're uh, welcome. Uh, great. Uh, Pam, any um, last thought you want to leave the families with who are with us today? Yes, I, I, I do want to just say that for families who might be listening, you're not alone. And it, it is frightening. Um, and there are organizations like mine and others around the state that can be a nice starting point for you to just reach out to, um, just to get a hug, just to hear like you're not alone. And then we'll, you know, we'll walk with you down that pathway to access some of these other services when you're ready. And to just remember, you know, it, this is a storm uh, that has moved into your home and um, we're here to help you, you know, navigate your way through that. Thanks, Pam. Thanks again for being with us today. And uh, Donna, uh, closing, closing comment for um, well, all of our attendees. Well, I mean, I would definitely like to stress that, you know, just to remember that it's not your fault. And we sometimes put so much blame on ourselves, you know, and, it's, it's not your fault that it's the biggest thing that I think people struggle with. And also, you know, like take care of yourself, like others were just saying, um, don't ignore your other family members, they need you too. you know, like your husband, your other children. Um, and I know that's what happened with me, I was so fixated on, you know, saving her learning, you know, and my husband said something to me one day, he said, you know, you talk about strengthening families and you're not strengthening your own. And it really hit home, you know, because I was just so tunnel vision about doing, you know, finding out what can I do? How can I help that I was forgetting, you know? So I think that's a huge thing that people do have to remember. Thanks, Donna. And thanks for being, uh, sharing such you know, a personal story about your life. And I know that it impacts uh, so many you can see from the comments on the chat, um, as well as having seen you speak in person, um, you know, people uh, really appreciate uh, you sharing that. So, um, so thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for that. And thanks for being with us today. Again, I want to thank um, all of our presenters. I think all of the information was so important to hear and so helpful. And I want to thank all of our participants um, for joining us today and for staying on with us as we ran over time a bit. Um, again, um, we'll be sending an email out uh, at the conclusion of this event with um, access to the slides as well as a recording of this event. So, um, and then we'll follow up with the resources that um, some of our speakers mentioned that they would be providing. Um, thank you so much. There's information on our upcoming webinar about uh, safe disposal of opioids, which is a really important key to uh, preventing diversion. And, uh, and so I hope you can join us on March 24th. The link to register is um, in the chat as well as, as on your screen. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day and be well.